Uh, okay, uh, probably we can get started and as people are joining. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, uh, Infos QSR and MBIS uh, joint webinar. And uh, my name is uh, Ili Hong, and uh, I'll be uh, chairing uh, this webinar today. Uh, it's my honor to introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Dan Abdi. Uh, Dan is a professor of uh, industrial engineering and management science at Northwestern University. Uh, his research and teaching interests are at the interface of engineering modeling, uh, statistical analysis, and predictive analytics, uh, with particular emphasis on uh, improving the operation of complex manufacturing and uh, enterprise systems. Uh, his work has been supported by numerous industrial and uh, government agencies and uh, he received the uh, prestigious NSF Career Award in 2001, the IIE Transaction Best Paper Award in 2003, and the Telemetrics Wilcoxon Prize in 2008, and the GQT uh, Nelson Award in 2018. So he served as the Editor-in-Chief for Telemetrics and for GQT, so which are the two top journals in our field. Uh, he's a fellow of SA, and he served as a chair for QSR and uh, also the director of manufacturing and the design and the engineering program at Northwestern. So, we, so then we'll be talking about uh, interpreting black box super fast learning models uh, for accumulated local effects. So with that, let's welcome Dan. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you, Healy, and thanks for inviting me for the webinar also. Uh, this is joint work with my current PhD student, Jingyu Zhu. Um, and as Yili said, it's how, how to interpret. You fit one of these, you know, popular supervised learning models like a like a neural network or boosted tree. They're black box. They might have great predictive power, but it's you can't really open it up and look at all the you know estimated quantities and and, and figure out what the effects of the individual inputs or predictor variables are. Um, so that's what this is about. How to help do that. Um, some uh, just some notation first. So. You got a set of training data, just like in a regression setting, you got n, little n is the number of rows of training data. You've got a vector of inputs or predictor variables, x1 through xd, where little d is the number of predictor variables. Y is the response variable. Notation here, f of x is just going to be whatever the fitted model is. So it inputs the, the predictors x and it outputs the predicted response. And I could have put a hat over f because it's all us fitted to, to data, but just to have cleaner notation, I left off a hat. So f of x is our model, our, our supervised learning model. And then if you want to think probabilistically about these models, if it's a regression setting with a numerical response, you can think of the model that you fit as being the conditional expectation of the response given your predictors. Or if it's a classification problem, you can think of, of f as being the predicted probability that the response falls into a particular class of interest, given the predictors. So if it's the you know the old traditional setting, linear logistic regression, you don't need any of this because it's easy to interpret the predictors. Each predictor's got its own coefficient, and you can just look at the sign of the coefficient to determine if the predictor's got a positive effect or a negative effect on the response, and it's linear by definition. Uh, but if you're fitting one of the one of the you know, fancier, popular models that people like to fit nowadays, like a, a small trees are easy to interpret, but larger trees, you know, more than 30 nodes or so, it, it gets difficult to interpret. Random forests, neural networks, support vector machines, nearest neighbors, kernel regression methods, et cetera, et cetera. They're all black box. So that's the, uh, that's, that's the setting here that where you've already fit your model F to your data and you've tuned it. And let's say you've used cross-validation properly and you're convinced it's a accurate enough model. And then you want to interpret. You just want to dig into it and understand what the effects of the predictors are. And in particular, what we're doing here is, is plotting some sort of average version of f of x versus individual predictors or versus pairs of predictors, if you want to understand how two predictors interact. Let me, I think, easiest to illustrate this with an example. Um, so this was, uh, this was uh, 
you know, moderate sized data set, 18,000 rows, 17,000 rows. Each row is one hour of data. It was trying to predict bike rentals, you know, the number of bike rentals. And this was an outfit, the bike sharing outfit in Washington, DC area. Let's see, sorry, each row, regression row corresponds to one hour. The response is the total number of bike rentals in that hour. There were 11 predictors that wound up in the model. There were eight numerical predictors, the month of the year, one through 12, hour of day, one through 24 or zero through 23, day of the week, weather situation where four is worse weather, one is better. I guess that's in terms of like rain and snow. Then there's temperature and a temp, which was described as a feeling temperature, I guess kind of a heat index or wind chill factor. And then humidity and wind speed. And three categorical predictors, the, the year, and then whether or not it was a holiday, um, just zero or one, yes, if it's a holiday, no, if it's not, whether it was a working day, and then uh, whether it was a yeah, working day, weekday or holiday is a not working day. So we fit uh, to these data, we fit a neural network and using the NNet package in R, um, tuned it with cross-validation, ended up the, you know, what was pretty much the best neural network had just single hidden layer, 10 nodes in the hidden layer, logistic output activation function, the decay parameter of 0.05, all tuned via threefold cross-validation. And then the cross-validation R squared was 90%, right? Which is pretty good for data like this. It's hard to get much higher than 90% cross-validation R squared. So good, good model, good predictive power. You know, next question was, you know, if, you were, if this were really your problem, well, before you use the model, you probably want to do some diagnostics or just try to dig into the model, try to understand what the effects of the predictors are. This is sort of the culmination. These show the results of the method I'm going to talk about for the next hour. Um, this shows, these are the effects of four of the 11 predictors. So the horizontal axis is the individual predictors. Vertical axis, I haven't defined that yet. That's coming up, but you can think of it as sort of the predicted response as a function of just individual predictors with the other predictors kind of averaged out in a sense to be described. And this is what you use to, to help interpret the, uh, the effects of the predictors. It kind of makes sense, everything here. If you look at versus month, you got January, two is February, three is March. You got the lowest rentals in the winter months and then it slowly ramps up and sort of, you know, reaches near peak in summer and then sort of peaks in late summer, early fall, and then goes back down. The effective hour of day, that makes sense. Um, no rentals in the wee hours of the morning. And then it ramps up steeply in this little peak here is morning rush hour. And then it dips back down in mid afternoon and then dips back up in the afternoon rush hour and then goes down. That makes sense. Weather situation, one is better weather, four is worse. So the Rentals monotonically go down as the it gets rainier or snowier. Um, same thing with wind speed. As the wind speed picks up, the rentals go down. Um, so this is sort of, uh, oh, we're, we're missing one thing here, right? These show you the effects of individual predictors. If there was no interactions, if it was an additive model and the predictors didn't interact with each other, then this would tell you the whole picture. But oftentimes predictor variables interact in regression settings. So we also got, um, look at the right plot. Don't look at the left plot yet. I'm gonna come back to that. Um, the right plot shows essentially how a pair of predictors interact. So the two axes are um, one predictor hour of day and a second predictor weather situation. And then the contour plots, uh, this is a contour plot and heat map. The, the numbers here are the, are the, you can think of as the values of, again, the predicted response as a function of these two predictors, sort of averaged with other predictors averaged out, right? So this is very interpretable too. It says if you wanna fix, look at weather situation 1.0, if you kind of look across this line here and look at how the predicted response varies in good weather, you got the real sharp rush hour peaks, morning rush hour peak, then the evening rush hour peak. You have the same thing with bad weather, but just the peaks aren't as pronounced. Of course, because the weather's worse, so not as many people are going to be riding a bicycle. 
right? So it's all kind of obvious, but the point here is that, you know, if it wasn't, you know, as obvious as this, plots like this can really help you understand how the predictors in your black box model affect the, the, the response. Um, and I haven't, I haven't defined what these are exactly. The, you know, most of the rest of the talk is going to be just defining what, what exactly are, what are we plotting in these plots? Um, but I want to do a little more introduction and motivation first. So why do we care? Why is this important? Well, you generally fit a, a supervised learning model for one or two purposes, either explanatory purposes, like some medical diagnostic study where you want to, where your predictors are input risk factors, and the response might be the risk of heart disease. Um, if it's explanatory purposes, then it's obvious why you want to interpret the predictors. That's the whole point. Uh, what about if it's just pure predictive purposes? And that's why you're fitting the model. Even then, it's a, it's a good idea to understand your model just for, you know, it all kind of boils down to transparency reasons, right? You want to, if it's transparent, if you understand the model, it gives you more confidence in it. That's sort of, that's a big motivation behind a lot of the explainable machine learning work that you see now. Don't just use a model that you fit. If you, you, know, you think it has good power, um, try to explain it first because sometimes it can be doing weird things. Sometimes you have to explain your model if it's a regulatory environment. Like if you're trying to predict consumer credit risk, if you're a credit card company, um, they have federal regulators that you, you can't use any predictive model until you sit down with the regulators and convince them that there's no inputs in your model that you're penalizing for. And if you shouldn't, like uh, you can't penalize for race, obviously, or you can't penalize, you can't give people a worse credit score because they're older. Right. So you got to, you know, you got to, if you have, if age is a factor in your model, which it can be, you'd have to show them that it's, you know, doesn't, uh, is monotonic in one direction and doesn't penalize for older people. So sometimes you have to be transparent and, and understand the predictors or my uh, sort of the, I think maybe the most common and important reason is just to, as a sanity check on the model, right? Let's say you do one of these plots and, and what you see really violates intuition. Like, let me give an example here. Let's, let's change this around. Let's suppose it was a different example. I'm trying to get my pen working here. Okay, let's say it's a different example. And let's say it's a, that, that, that medical risk factor study that I mentioned. So X11, let's say, is age of a patient. Right? Each row of data would be one patient. Let's say the response was whether or not they had a particular heart disease. So maybe it fit a, a classification model to predict the probability that a patient develops a certain heart disease as a function of age. If you fit the model, and you saw something like this, where the risk of heart disease just went down as the patient went older, got older, right? Maybe you thought you tuned your model properly and it was a good model and had, had good power and cross-validation. Um, if you saw this, you know, then you'd know that either you discovered something really surprising that, that people have heart disease risk goes down as people get older, or, or you know, in general, you discover something surprising you want to know about, or what's more likely, you just got some bad data. You know, somehow the model got corrupted. Right? So either way, seeing something like this and, and understanding the effects of the predictors are important just as a sanity check. Okay, why is it challenging? Well, if all the predictors were independent, then this would actually be an easy problem. All of the difficulties, for reasons that, that will become apparent shortly, all the difficulty arises when you've got predictors that are not independent, when they're correlated. And that's the, that's the norm. And, what, and mostly you fit these supervised learning models to observational data sets. When you got observational data sets, you almost always have variables that are correlated, sometimes highly correlated, right? So that really makes it complicated. And, and you know, what you wanna do essentially is just, if you wanna understand the main effect of a predictor XJ, you, you sort of have to, in some sense, average out the effects of the other predictors. So if little d is the total number of predictors, my notation here, a bold x with a backslash j, backslash j means all the predictors but the jth one. So you somehow want to average out the effect of the, the other predictors. 
Okay, well, let me go into you know, existing methods and, and really why having correlated predictors is a big problem for this. Now, most of this slide is not really that relevant. You know, the most relevant thing is partial dependence plots. Right? That's by far the most common existing method that dates back to something Jerry Friedman did about uh, 20 years ago. It appeared in his original gradient boosted machine paper. And it was a method to visualize the effects of predictors for that. Um, but it's general, you can apply it to any supervised learning model. And there's something else called marginal plots, which are really not used for these purposes um, because they're, they just don't work for this for reasons I'm gonna talk about in a second. Um, but I wanna, I wanna talk about them anyway, cause it kind of sets up, you know, what's wrong with them and, and why partial dependence plots get around that and why we need to still another method. These other methods aren't really that great for this purposes. Some, this group of methods here, they really plot a, a bunch of individual plots. They sort of just fix values of your other predictors and then plot the predicted response versus just individual predictors at some discrete set of fixed values for the other predictors. Right. And that's subject to a lot of problems and it gets kind of cluttered and messy and, and difficult to interpret. There's something called functional ANOVA, Sobel decompositions, which, you know, you could, if you decompose a function using Sobel decomposition, you can always plot the individual functions to try to understand it. This is something that used, that's used a lot for understanding these black box surrogate models fit to black box computer experiments, almost never used for understanding supervised learning models fit to data. Um, because it's just a computational nightmare and they're mostly intended for independent predictors and there's really no good methods for dependent predictors. So the, the, the partial dependence plot is sort of the main existing method. And let me explain what that is and, and what's wrong with it. And let me first talk about the, those marginal plots. So this illustrates what both of these existing plots are. I'm gonna illustrate for the simple case where you just got two predictors. So here's a scatter plot of your training data. This is a plot of the two predictors, x1 versus x2. Not the vertical axis is the other predictor, not the response. So what's an m plot, a marginal plot? Um, both of them you'd start by discrete. If you want to, if you find an m plot for let's say x1 to understand the and, and the goal is to produce a plot that's you know kind of like these plots here to help you understand the predictors individually. So if you want to do that for x1 you discretize the x1 axis into, let's say, 50 points. And then for each of those points, let's say x1 equals 0.3, you would plug in that fixed value of x1 here. And then you'd take x2 to be a random variable. And you'd plug in the random variable x2 into your supervised learning model to predict the response f. And then you take the, the expected value, the average predicted response, as x2 varies over its conditional distribution because you're conditioned in that on x1. So that would be like this. That would be like plugging in x1 and x2 values all along this little line segment. And then you'd average the predicted response along this line segment. And that's the point that you plot at x1 equals 0.3. And then you do that for all 50 values of x1. And then you'd get a, an m plot. And of course, this is the theoretical definition that in, in practice, what you compute given a set of data, the estimator is you, you bin up, you know, you discretize the X1 axis, you'd make little bins around each discrete point, And then you take all of the training observations that fell into that bin. And I guess you'd plug in still that fixed value of X1, but you'd plug in the training X2 values that fell into that little bin. And you average capital N of X1 means a little neighborhood about that value of X1. Little n of x1 is the number of training observations that fell into that neighborhood, right? So you're just, you're just replacing the expectation by a sample average. And that's the estimator. So why doesn't this work? It's kind of obvious when, when you think about it. That people never use this to understand the effects of the individual predictors because it conflates the effects of two predictors if they're correlated. When you look, when you calculate the m plot value for x1 equals 0.3, if you did the same thing for x1 equals 0.9 over here, then you'd be plugging in x1, x2 values over in this region and averaging the response. Well, because x1 and x2 are correlated, both x1 and x2 changed from, from this region over to this region, right? Both x1 and x2 changed. 
So you couldn't tell if the change in the predicted response was because X1 changed or X2 changed. Right, so that's why implants are just never used for these purposes with when you got correlated predictors. Well, that's where partial dependence plot come in, comes in, that they get around that problem. And what they do is instead of taking the conditional expectation on a each fixed value of X1 for, for when they plug in X2 into the model as a random variable, they use the marginal distribution of X2, right? So for this data set, if you look at the marginal distribution of X2, Right, if you take all the X2 values and you, and you project them onto the X2 axis and looked at the distribution, this little curve here, loaf shaped curve is sort of like the marginal distribution of X2. So to calculate the partial dependence plot value at X1 equals 0.3, you would simply plug in X1 and X2 values across this entire line. So that means you'd plug in, right, you'd take all these points and you'd project them over the So you'd plug in X1, X2 values all along this entire line. And then you'd average the predicted response F for those values of X2. And then when you computed the partial dependence plot and another value of X1, let's say 0.8, you'd plug in that different value of X1, but for X2, you'd plug in the same marginal distribution values for X2, the same that you used over here. So that's how the, the marginal plot, because you're plugging in the same X2 values at each value of X1, it no longer conflates the effect of the two predictors. But you can see another problem with that, right? Look at the, the training data because of the correlation only fell within this kind of narrow envelope. You didn't have any training observations even close to here. So when you plug in X2, X1, X2 values up here, you, know, you have to extrapolate severely. And these models just aren't reliable for extrapolating like that. So the extrapolation is the problem with partial dependence plots. Okay, so kind of a long introduction, but just to set up the problem with existing methods. And then our solution to that is uh, we developed a method called accumulated local effects plots. Um, had a, I originally started this back in 2016, but the paper finally got published in 2020. And the rest of the talk is really just describing what this approach is. Um, this gives you the main idea. Um, again, I'm just illustrating it for the simple case where you got two predictors. So here's the same correlated training data, X1 versus X2. And remember what the mplot does. mplot avoids extrapolation because it uses the conditional distribution of X2 given X1. And it would you know, plug in X2 values along this line. Partial dependence plot gets around that conflating effects of predictors by plugging in the marginal distribution. But then you got to extrapolate. So what we do is we avoid extrapolation like M plots by still using the conditional distribution of, of X2 given X1, right? So we're still plugging in values along this line segment here. But instead of averaging the response itself, we take the derivative of the predicted response with respect to X1. Right. That's, you can think of the derivative with respect to X1 as being the local effect of X1. Right? So if you plug in this value of X2 and you take the derivative with respect to X1, it tells you what the local effect of X1 is at that point. So we average the local effect. And then that's just the average local effect, the average derivative. To get sort of something that corresponds to the function value back, you have to integrate that. So the AL plot value that you would plot at a particular value of X1 would be the integral from some lowest point, X1, up to the X1 you're plotting at. You just integrate that average local effect. And then the, uh, you know, the estimator is just the, you basically replace the average, the ex expectation by a sample average of the, the local effect along sort of this, this region here. Um, this is an overview, more, uh, more details coming up. Here, here's the general definition. If you've got any number of predictor variables and you want to calculate this AL plot main effect for a predictor XJ, right, you take the partial derivative of your predicted response with respect to XJ, 
for each fixed value of x, you, you still start by discretizing the xj axis into let's say 50 points. And for each discrete value, you plug in that value of xj, and then you take this average local effect, average partial derivative, and that's averaging with respect to all values of x backslash j that occur conditioned on that one value of xj. And then you integrate up from some lower xj point, you know, that in practice we take it to be like the minimum training value for xj. You'd integrate that up to the xj value for that point at which you're plotting it at. And then you do that for each x, all 50 xj points that you want to plot at. Um, then you might wonder, well, you know, you got to take the derivative of f with respect to xj. What happens if your supervised learning model is not differentiable, like with a tree or random forest or boosted tree, which are collections of trees? No problem. We've got a more general definition that basically just replaces the, replaces the derivative with a finite difference and then replaces the integral with a summation. Um, so the general definition works out perfectly fine for non-differentiable. And then it redo in, in the special case that your function really is differentiable, the general definition just reduces to the differentiable one. And then the good thing is that it, you know, it really doesn't matter if it's differentiable or not because the estimator, how you compute this in practice, given a sample of data and a fitted supervised learning model, that's the same regardless. And really what that does, it just replaces the derivative with finite differences across bins Right, you partition the xj range into bins, maybe 50 bins, capital K equals 50. You take the finite difference across bins, right? and then you replace the expectation by a sample average within bin, and then you replace the integral with the summation. And that's the same regardless of whether it's a like a differentiable model like a neural network or a non-differentiable model like a tree. Well, maybe I should have showed this picture first because it, it shows the idea of how to compute the estimator. Ignore the notation. I guess that's details that we don't need at this point. I think I can explain the main idea without all the notation. Um, this is just a simple situation where you've got 30 training observations, just to illustrate things, and D equals two predictors. So here's a scatter plot of the training data, X1 versus X2. If you want to compute the AL, estimate the AL main effect for X1, you discretize the x1 axis into, in this case, we use k equals five bins, but you know usually we use 50 or something like that. So what you do for, for this bin right here, you would plug in this fixed value of x1 here in the middle of the bin, and then you would take the predicted response at this point here and the predicted response at this point here at the two edges of the bin, you take the difference, and that's the local effect of x1 for that value of x2. And you do the same thing for all five training observations that fell into that bin. So for each of these five, you get five local effects, each for a different value of x2. And then you simply average those five, and that's your average local effect at this point. And then the AL plot value that you plot at x1 equals this point you would just sum up the average local effect for all four bins up to this point. So you'd accumulate the local effects from some lowest X1 value up to this point. And then of course you do that for each bin. So the value you plot at the third bin would be the sum of the first three local effects. Fourth bin, the sum of the first four, fifth bin, the sum of the first five. And that's basically it. Um, and then we've got, that was the main effect. We've also got a, uh, the second order, right? Because main effects don't tell you everything. You want to understand interactions. So we define the, the second order AL interaction effect between the pair of predictors, let's say XJ and XL. You take, it's a similar idea, but instead of taking just the, the derivative, you would take the second order partial derivative with respect to that pair of predictors. And you take that second order partial derivative, you would plug in the random variable x backslash jl, all the predictors except j and l, and then you would average this second order. You can think of the second order partial derivative as like the second order local effect of xj and xl. You would average that for all values of the other predictors that occur conditioned on those two values of xj and xl. 
And that's your, that's your average local effect. And then you have to accumulate it by integra double integrating now because you're in 2D space from some lower left point. I got a plot on the next slide to illustrate that. Um, but let me, uh, so, so the estimator is the same logic too. You'd replace the second order partial derivative with a second order finite difference. And you start by partitioning, well, you know, let me illustrate with a figure here. So, so to calculate the second order effect of xj and xl, again, here's your training data. You'd partition both xj and xl axis up into, in this case, five bins. You know, again, in practice, we do 50 bins for each maybe. And you take the grid of the, that partition, which gives you cells. And then in this cell right here, you had two training observations that fell into it. You would plug in the x backslash j values that occurred for these two points. And then for the xj, xl values, you'd, you'd plug in the values on the four corners and take the second order of finite difference. And then you would average that for the two training observations that, that fell into this bin. And that would be the average second order finite difference you know, that, that locally at this point. And then the value that you would plot in the heat map at, at this point right here, you would double sum all of the average second order local effects from some lower left point up to, let me draw that, that would be you would average sum up the local effects in, in all of these bins to get the value that you'd plot in the heat map at this point. Um, so that's the basic idea behind uh, but behind this. Let me, uh, let me go back to that bike sharing example. And if you recall, the slide that I showed previously, right? I mean, this is exactly what I'm showing. I'm showing the, the AL plot, the vertical axis here is the what I defined as the AL plot main effect for these four predictors, right? These all made sense. The, the morning and the evening rush hour peaks made sense and the other predictors made sense. This one showing the interaction between the pair of predictors made sense. I guess I also made a point, I don't know if I mentioned this, but it was in the slide, I think. For the main effect, I say you subtract out a constant. The constant we subtracted out was just to vertically center this. So that if you, if you took this AL plot function value and plugged in all n training rows for x, xj, all n training observations, you take the average of that, you'd want that to be zero. So we subtract the constant to vertically center it. For the second order one, we also center it, but we subtract out a few things. We, we first compute this function that, that I'm defining here. And then for this function, we calculate the main effect of the two predictors on this function itself and subtract those out. And then finally, we, we subtract out the average of that. So it's all centered. So, so you can think of this, you know, the definition of the second order interaction is being centered because it's got no main effects and it's got no zero order effects, which is their average. That's actually what I'm plotting in the, in this left plot, I'm plotting the zeroed version which I like to do because then you see some values are negative, some are positive. You can easily gauge the strength of the interaction by plotting this one. But then if you wanna turn around and understand the effects of the two predictors together jointly, what we do is we, we, we take this zeroed second order, main, second order interaction effect, and then we just add in the two main effects for the predictors. Right, so you, together then in this plot, this is the non-centered version. And I think it's easier to interpret the effects of the two predictors together with that. Right, so these plots before all made sense. Let me show you something that was a little more interesting, or I should say less obvious. Oh, I take it back. Give me, I, I wanted to talk about, uh, before I go back to the bike sharing example, uh, let me just show you a little toy example that really illustrates how the partial dependence plot and M plots can break down. So here's a toy data set, simulated data set where X1 and X2 were highly correlated. We had 200 training observations. So this is a scatter plot of the 200 training observations. The response was linear in X1 and quadratic in X2. 
And I gave it no observation error. So it's noiseless, noiseless data. And then I fit a hundred node tree to the data, right? And you know, the hundred node tree, that seems like a lot of nodes right, for just two predictors. But the reason is because it was noiseless data. So tree with uh, more nodes it did better value predicting. Um, so that's, this shows the first, uh, the first eight, I guess the first seven splits of the tree. And then these rectangular regions are the correspond to the first seven splits of the tree. Here are the results. The left plot are the, is the main effect for X1. The right plot is the main effect for X2. And I'm showing you four different methods or three different methods. The solid line is the true function, right? Because so, remember, we're truly linear in X1, so the black linear straight line. And then we're truly quadratic in X2, so you got this quadratic X2 effect. The AL plot for both came out to be very close, right? That's the blue dotted curve, right? A little bit of noise in the estimator, but it, it hugs the true effect pretty closely. The M plot, that's the dashed line, totally useless for this purpose, because remember I said before that the problem with M plots is that it conflates the effects of the two predictors. And you can see that here, it thinks the effect of X1 is the same as the effect of X2 and it's conflating the linear and quadratic effect. Partial dependence plots, it can separate the effects of X1 and X2, but remember it had to extrapolate. And so it's really inaccurate. At least at partial dependence plot under, that's the red dash curve, understood that the effect of X1 was linear and the effect of X2 was quadratic, but it, it way underestimated the slope of X1 by about half. And it overestimated the effect of X2. And it's because it had to extrapolate, which you can kind of see here, right? If you're trying to compute the partial dependence plot value at let's say x1 equals 0.3, remember you've got to plug in x1, x2 values all along this line. So when you plug in up here, it's got to severely extrapolate and you can kind of see that there's no data in this region. So the tr when the tree predicts the response in this region, it's not going to be this correct curve. It's going to be whatever it was predicted over here. Right. So that's the sort of the problem with extrapolation. All right. Well, let me go back to the bike sharing example, right? So the, the remember the results we showed before all seem to make pretty good sense. Um, there were some other um, sort of less more subtle and kind of interesting aspects of this example for feeling temperature. These two plots here are the, on the left is the AL plot and on the right is the partial dependence plot for the feeling temperature, okay? totally different. And keep in mind, this is the exact same, it, it, both are computed, the AL plot and the partial dependence plot. They're computed for the exact same fitted neural network. We're not fitting two different neural networks. It's just, it's the same model. They're just analyzing the model differently. AL plot says, and you can probably ignore it. When, when you look anything above, I mean, this is feeling temperature in degrees Celsius. It's Washington, DC. So there's quite a few days of the year where the feeling temperature is, you know, 40 or, or above a little bit, but there's not much at 50. So I would probably not even, maybe above this point, it's not even worth looking at it. And same thing in this plot here. Don't look at this tip. So what ALPLOT took that neural network model and when it analyzed it to find the effect of, of X9, it said, well, if it's too cold, people don't bike. As the temperature warms up, more people bike. You have some peak sort of optimum biking temperature that occurs at 24 degrees Celsius, which I think is about 75 degrees Fahrenheit. And you know, 75 degrees Fahrenheit, this is feeling temperature. So I guess the actual temperature might be a little bit lower than that. But, you know, if, 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 the, if the temperature gets either above that or below that, the number of bike rentals decreases, which makes sense to me because if it's too hot, if it's, you know, 100, if it's hot and humid, 98 degrees and in, in humid in, in Washington, DC, you're not gonna wanna bike around, right, as much. So AL plot makes sense. Partial dependence plot completely missed that, right? It thought that the rentals just continuously increase right, as biking temperature increases. Um, 
So, you know, to me, the AL plot makes a lot more sense. And I think I have more faith in it also knowing that, well, partial dependence plot has to extrapolate substantially, right? And that, that's probably why it's not reliable. So that was kind of interesting, the big difference between AL plot and part. And a lot of times, um, I would say nine out of 10 times for nine out of 10 predictors, the examples I've done, they give you pretty much the same result, AL plot and partial dependence plot. It's just occasionally you'll get very different results, something like this. And then I trust AL plots more. But even when they're the same, AL plots have a huge advantage. The computational expense is far, far better with AL plots. Right. For, for each of these, um, there was 18,000 rows in the training data set. Took less than a second for each AL main effect and interaction plot. And I discretized the axes into 500. You don't really need 500, 50 or 100 is enough, typically, but I use 500 here. Took 25 seconds for each partial dependent main effect plot. Took eight minutes for each partial dependent interaction plot using K equals 100. So it's just, uh, that's because the, the partial dependence plot for an interaction plot, you make a grid, it'd be a hundred by hundred grid. For each of those 10,000 points in that grid, you've got to plug all N training rows data into, into your model. Whereas with the AL plot, you don't, you just, you know, in each cell of the grid, you plug in just a fraction of the data, you know, only the data that occurred in that grid. So it ends up being far, far more computationally inexpensive than PD plots do. And then here's something then, and just, uh, I'll try to close up pretty soon. I had, uh, you know, if there was, if I had a longer time, I'd talk about something else that's related. These AL plots give rise to something called variable importance measures, right? Just numerical measures, you know, a single numerical measure for each predictor just to tell how important it is. Right, which is all sometimes that's the first thing you might want to do once you fit a supervised learning model. Just if I've got 11 predictors in the model, just tell me how important each one is and, and rank them. AL plots have kind of lend themselves very well to sort of a new variable importance measure. And that's what these are here. I don't think I'm, since I'm sort of running out of time, I won't have time to define exactly what these variable importance measures are. Um, but, you know, at least I will want them. Ignore the top, you know, the top are derivative based importance measures, which I don't like. The, the bottom two are what we like a lot better, which are variance based importance measures. And if you're familiar with global sensitivity analysis, Sobel decomposition, global sensitivity analysis, there's always something called main effect sensitivity and, and total effect sensitivity in global sensitivity analysis. Two different, and the main effect sensitivity just measures the, how important the main effect of the variable is. The total effect sensitivity measures how important the variable is totally, including any interactions it might have, right? Main effect doesn't consider interactions between other variables. You can have a predictor that has no main effect, but is really important because it's got strong interactions with other predictors. So you got two different measures, a main effect and a total effect. And I can really quickly define the main effect, because that's an easy one. It's just the variable importance measure main effect. I'll put a main for x1 is equal to just the sample variance. You take your AL function estimator, a, f hat AL, I guess I called it for x1 to be f hat 1 AL x i 1. You look at that for i equals 1, 2 to n. So what that means is you take your AL function that you've estimated, you plug in all n, little i is the row index, so you plug in all n training observations for x1 into your AL, estimated AL function, and then you just simply take the sample variance of all those. So that's, our, that's what I'm plotting here, the, ma uh, the main effect VIM for each predictor. The, but, but again, that ignores, since that's only looking at the main effect, it totally ignores interactions. The total effect VIM considers interactions. That was a little trickier to define. And I don't, unfortunately, I'm, I don't think I have time to take too long to mathematically define all the notation to define that. Um, if I 
give another presentation, I might talk about that. But let me just talk about the results here. So here we've got the total effect, T for total effect. We ordered the 11 predictors in terms of the, the, the total effect, most important to least important. Most important was hour of day, and then work day, and then so on. And that's what, that's what this plot is here, right? So hour of day was most important. Workday was next. It looks like it was a lot less important, but I guess I should have probably plotted the square root of these values because this is sort of variance based. If you take the square root, it's in units of standard deviation, which I think is a better comparison. So the, the other predictors were still important. It's not as important. Um, so that's how, how they're ordered. And if you look, if you compare the main effect and, and total effect, you notice something interesting. X6 was the second most important total effect but it was the least important in terms of main effect. So basically it had no main effect, right? That means on average, there was neither more nor fewer rentals for, for being a workday versus not a workday. And again, a workday, a, a not a workday is weekend or holiday. Workday is anything else. It had no main effect. People rent about the same on, on you know, workday or not, right? And yet it was a really important predictor so if this was your problem, you would look at these results and you would say, oh, this means one thing, one and only one thing, that Workday must have strong interaction with, with some of the other predictors. So the next step might be, well, let's look at the interaction plots between Working Day and, and, and your other predictors to see which predictors it interacts with. And here's the interaction. Interaction was strongest with hour of day and, and with temperature. Okay. So that's what these two plots are. And be careful interpreting this. Working day, work day is just binary. It takes on two values, one if it's not a working day or two if it is a working day. I got kind of lazy when I coded this at first and, and really the only thing relevant on these plots are the, 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 you know, the contour plot values along this line and along this line, the same thing here and here. You know, the values in between are meaningless. So, so just look at the values on this line. How would you interpret the interaction between working day and hour of day? It kind of makes sense, right? If, you're, if it's not a working day, a weekend or holiday, or let, let's look at the working day first. 2.0, it's a working day. There you've got the rush hour peaks. You got the morning rush hour peak and the evening rush hour peak, and then you got a lull in the afternoon. If it's not a working day, you don't have that. Of course, because there's no rush hour. You just, it peaks sort of mid-afternoon around 2 or 3 p.m. And if you go, you know, later than that or earlier than that, the rentals tail off. Right? That tells you something. Re remember the main effect plot of hour of day. We had two peaks. Right? That was actually misleading because this plot here shows you those two peaks are a lot more pronounced. When you, you know, if it is a working day, these two peaks are much more pronounced than they were in the main effect plot. Why? Because the main effect plot was combining not a working day where you've, you know, you've got no rush hour peaks. You've just got, in fact, it, it's less at rush hour than it is at 2 p.m. So the main effect plot kind of combines that together. So, but you look at the interaction plot, you can really see, you know, you can see the effect of hour of day and, and, and working day better. And then this one, um, this one was kind of interesting here, interaction between working day and temperature. Okay. What does this tell you? Both, if you, if you look at the, you know, along these two lines for working day equals one and two, it tells you that either working day or not a working day, there's still an optimum biking temperature. That's around probably the same, 75 degrees Fahrenheit. If you go hotter than that, or if you go lower than that, then the rentals decrease. And that's the same working day or not. But what it tells you is something kind of interesting. The steepness with which the rentals drop off as the temperature deviates from optimum, that's a little bit different. If it's not a working day, the rentals drop off more sharply when, when the temperature deviates. If it is a working day, the rentals drop off a little bit less abruptly. And that's something that's not obvious at first, but when you think about it, it makes sense because you know, on a working day, a lot of the bike rentals are people biking to work. 
you know, if it's your routine, your habit, you'd like to work every day, rent the bike and bike to work. Then if the weather is not optimum, you're probably still going to, you know, you're, you're, you know, you're, you're more likely to keep to your routine. Whereas if it's not a working day, you know, you're a weekend or a vacationer and you just want to bike around DC to the museums, you know, if it's not optimum, you might uh, be less inclined to ride a bike and instead Uber over to the museums or something like that. So I thought that kind of made sense too and was interesting. Um, I'm probably, uh, I want to leave a few time for question and answers. And the rest of the slide, I, there are some properties of ale plots. Uh, oh, it's got some nice properties. And I don't think I have time to go through this method. Maybe I'll just, let me mention this last one. This is sort of a main justification. You know, I think the definition of ale plots kind of makes sense intuitively. But if you want a mathematical justification, I guess it would be this, where if your function, your supervised learning model truly is additive, then the ale plots, if you look at the theoretical definition, it gives you the correct results. The ale plot for the jth predictor is exactly what that you know, true function is, just plus a constant. And then the same thing for the, if, you, if your true function, your supervised learning model has, is additive up to second order interactions, but doesn't have any third or higher order interactions, then again, the ale plot produces the correct functions back up to functions of individual variables, which doesn't matter because if you add in functions of individual variables to an interaction function, it doesn't change how you interpret the interaction. And we center them anyway by subtracting out the, you know, so, so the, the, the AL plot value or plot has, has no main effect functions because we subtract those out anyway. Uh, well, let me, let me just stop here and uh, leave a few minutes for questions at least. Okay, uh, I think it's very nice uh, a talk and uh, really interesting ideas here. And uh, uh, any questions from the uh, audience? Uh, if you have any questions, just feel free to unmute yourself. Uh, you can just ask. And then let me, if you're interested in using this, we have our own package we put out. It's called AL, it's an R package. AL plot is the package name. And then we didn't do it. We're, we're, we got a Python package in the works, but there's a, there's a few other groups have made Python packages. So if you want to implement this in Python, you know, you can get Aleplot from CRAN, our R package. If you want to use it for Python, you've got a bigger data set and fit the model in Python, then, you know, just Google Aleplot for Python and you'll pull up, um, last I checked, I think were two or three packages that, that some other groups had done. So how much extra work we have to do if, you, if we fit our own machine learning model and uh, do we have to write some program to use your package or have to like a kind of a interface? Yeah, good question. This is really easy. The answer is if you're using the R one, no, we just have one input argument to the ALPLOT function. You just give it the predictive function, right? All you have to do is, you know, f, f of x, you know, this is your supervised learning model that you fit, right? So you have to write just like a one line wrapper and you have to tell the ale plot package, what is the function for which you want to compute the ale plot, right? So really all, all for, for, for almost all, the, if, if you like fit a neural network in R or use GBM package to fit a boosted tree or random forest, then I write just a, just a one line user defined function that basically just called most of those R functions have a built-in command called predict, right? With it, with the supervised learning models, it basically just calls that predict command. Okay, so so, uh, so basically really they can scale up to like a really big data set and uh, have many variables. Uh, like if you have a neural network, you have like, like millions of parameters, but it doesn't matter, right? So you can still use in your approach. It still the approach and it basically, you can think of it this way. The main computational expense for ale plots. I don't know if I have it here. I had a slide somewhere in the slide that I didn't talk about. Yeah, the main computational expense for ale plots. I guess I don't say that here, but if you're computing the main effect, you have to plug in, right? You've got, you plug in F of X, J, and then X, all the other predictors for the ith row and then backslash j. And you do that for i equals one, two, to n. 
So you basically have to plug in because we're taking for main effects, we're taking the discrete difference across bins. For all n observations, you have to plug in actually two values of xj. So it only requires the total number of function calls to you know to your predict command is just two n. I so see. It's computational expense. Yeah, it's a very nice idea. Yeah. Oh, yeah. how about how do you handle categorical variables? I, I think I have too many questions. <laughs> no, good, great, great, great question. I, I didn't talk about that. That's an, we have kind of a, if it's ordinal categorical, then it's a no brainer. You just order them and you take the, when you take the finite difference across bins, you just, you know, keep them ordered. If it's nominal categorical, it ends up working really well. And, and you know, in, in some sense, it doesn't matter how you order the categories. Right, except that you want to be careful. You still don't want to extrapolate. Do I have? Yeah, some of these. In the bike sharing example, some of the predictors were categorical. Yeah, that's a working, not working day. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, and, and even categorical, like, uh, do we have it for that? Categorical with other categories, with if, like, like if you got six or seven or ten categories, I've done it for other examples with that. It all works nicely, and basically. I think what would be best to illustrate this. Yeah, so if it's categorical, so if this axis is categorical, you know, you still take, we still take discrete differences across bins, across categories, right? Really, the only potential problem with that is if when you order the categories, if, let me see if I can draw it here. Let's say, here's your bins. Your categories. Let's say in this bin here, this is x2, this is x1. Let's say all the observations are down here in this bin, the, and, and the x2 observations are up here, and then down here, and down here, and up here. When you take differences across bins, you got to extrapolate in this case. If it wasn't for that, it really you could really order it any way you want, and it wouldn't matter. But to avoid this extrapolation, what we did, we just took these categories, and we try to arrange them, order them, basically in a way that required the least amount of extrapolation. And there was a pretty simple way of doing that. I probably can't really you know, give in too many more details without getting into the math, and I don't even think I have that in the slides, but we have a paper actually, that's in, in, the, in the JRSS paper that I mentioned, that was, I have it. yeah. It, that explains, you know, how to, the, the trick for ordering the categories. But it worked. You know, we found it works really robustly, and and uh, haven't seen any like really weird results with categorical predictors either. Okay. Yeah, I think it's a very very uh, nice uh, uh, paper. I probably will definitely read it. And uh, so uh, I think we're probably out of time. And uh, I I would say Dan again for uh, give us a, a talk. Uh, and also I thank everyone who are attending. And uh, this video uh, was recorded, and uh, after a while, we'll put it on uh, QSI website, and also QSI members will be able to watch it. And uh, I think this probably uh, concludes our uh, webinar. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Yeah, thank you, Healy. Yeah, thanks. thank you, Dan. Very nice talk. Bye-bye. Yeah,